Now we are with a great nonprofit organization called CASA, and with me is Executive Director Maria Long. How are you, Maria? Good, good, nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, on. definitely. Your, your organization is so special for us and for many people, but I would like to start by asking you what exactly is CASA and why it's so unique? Well, we are one of, of many CASAs in the state of California, but it's the acronym for Court Appointed Special Advocates. Mm -hmm. And what we are is we're a volunteer agency that tr recruits, screens, and trains volunteers to speak for foster children in the court system. So we actually are the only nonprofit that operates within the courts. How many kids need CASA here in Santa Barbara? Well, right now it fluctuates. The number of kids in care, um, sometimes it's greater and larger and weekly it changes. Right now, at point in time today, uh, there are approximately over 650 children in foster care mm -hmm. in our county. We continually always have a wait list of about 125 waiting for an advocate. How can somebody become a CASA volunteer? Because I'm, I'm sure you screen them somehow, right? Yes, we do. We go through actually um, First of all, anybody over um, a 21 mm -hmm. can become a CASA. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have a special degree, you don't need to be a lawyer, you just have to be, care about kids and have a genuine passion for helping this population. And um, we go through an extensive screening process to make sure that you're actually ready to become an advocate. Mm -hmm. We go through a thorough background check, you get fingerprinted by the FBI, we do a live scan check, we go, go through the Child Abuse Central Index, we even check your DMV record to make sure you're safe if you're going to transport a child. And then we put you through a 40-hour training and court observation and then you're sworn in as an officer of the court. So it's really um, a very dedicated volunteer position, I don't mean for it to be intimidating, but, but it's very enriching, it's very rewarding, and, and in the end you understand how complicated these children's lives are. Can you illustrate uh, the process itself? Like if I want to become a volunteer, what, what happens? Well, what you would do is uh, contact CASA, mm -hmm. either by email or by phone number, and mm -hmm. we have a, a volunteer recruiter, her name's Kim Davis, and then she'll put you through the initial uh, in interview process. And then once you're fully ready and you're fully committed to being there for this child, then, then we start the training. Um, once you've completed the training, our case managers, who really are the heart of the work that we do, they will pull three files for you of a child waiting for a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And you get to read that case and you pick the child that calls to you. You pick to help that child. And how many times can you help? We like you to choose one child to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, Many times a CASA will take siblings, brothers and sisters, so they, they'll take all four cases, some, three or four, which oh, is a lot, mm -hmm. but they can do that. Um, the typically, we ask for a year commitment to be an advocate, um, but many of our advocates stay on for two or three or four years. We have had some CASAs that have been with us as long as the program's been in existence, mm -hmm. and there are our master CASAs, and we, and we love them. They're, they're wonderful people. Who selects the foster families? The foster families are um, selected by the county, mm -hmm. Child Welfare Services. They have a great uh, foster care recruiter, and they're the ones um, who actually do the training and screening of the foster parents. Mm -hmm. Now, the CASAs don't take the kids home. The CASAs make sure that wherever the ch children are in the process mm -hmm. of what they're doing, let's say they've been removed, they're in their first foster family, they want to make sure that those child's medical records, their dental records, their school records, their mental health records are all up to date, that these children are getting all the necessary services that they need to survive this really trying time. Mm -hmm. And that there's there somebody there that cares about them. Yeah, do you um, remember like a nice example? I know it's confidential, most of them, but something that uh, it's more specific yeah, for the viewer. Yeah, there's a really, um, there's a beautiful story um, that, the actually Judge Herman, our judge, tells frequently and um, we had uh, a CASA who was assigned to a little boy that was deaf and as it turned out there was nobody in, in his biological family or his foster family that knew how to communicate with him because nobody had ever bothered to learn sign language mm -hmm. and part of the law is that you have to communicate with the child in their own language so learning sign it was his language in our CASA went to and took classes, learned how to sign with him, and now he can communicate. Wow. It's a, and when you see them together, it's really wonderful because here they're interacting, and she's helping him and speaking for him to the judge in the court. And I'm sure those relationships go 
almost forever, I guess. Well, yeah, they do. And <laughs> when know. you're when when what happens is a lot of times the casas fall in love with their children, and yeah. so even after um, even after the case is closed, and ideally they wind up in a safe, permanent nurturing home, mm -hmm. um, the uh, the relationship continues unofficially. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know casas that have said that they've attended their casa children's weddings or okay. been with them for years and years even after they're out of the system. Mm -hmm. And for some children that one permanent person, the CASA, has made the entire difference in shaping and transforming their lives. Let's talk about fundings. How do you hold CASA? We operate as an independent nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We get a small percentage from the state of California from the administrative office of the courts mm -hmm. and every CASA across the state gets that same amount. But we are responsible for fundraising all the other dollars that, that come across. So we have government grants, we have corporations that fund us, we have um, pr uh, foundation grants, we do a lot of special events, and then we have our pri private donors and our major donors that give us gifts every year. And how many people work uh, permanently in, in CASA here? Right now we have 16. Mm -hmm. um, we have an office north and south and primarily the funding goes to the, pro the program which is the case managers. Mm -hmm. Our case managers are the ones that really oversee and guide the advocates through this process. Um, they can only have 30 advocates per their caseload. Mm -hmm. So depending on how many advocates we have at any given time then we'll have uh, case managers north and south um, and then we also have our a volunteer recruiter and trainer full time. We do nine trainings a year, our program director, and then our, of course, our accounting. People always ask me, why, why do you need, if this is a volunteer organization, why do you need to raise so much money? Well, the truth of it is, is that it costs approximately $3,000 per child um, to recruit, screen, train, support, and advocate for one year. Mm -hmm. So, because there's so much that goes into this particular volunteer position, they really need to rely on the case managers and the resources. Could you give us or provide us with uh, information, website, or phone numbers in case somebody wants to become a volunteer? Absolutely. Um, our website is sbcasa.org, mm -hmm. and then or they can call us at 805-845-8364. It's a really beautiful way to volunteer. Well, thank you, Maria. Thank Good you. Good luck with your organization. Thank you so much. For more information on the Nonprofit Spotlight, check our website at www.spchannels.tv or call 963-3893.